Good evening. My name is Simon Godwin, and I am the Artistic Director of the Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington, D.C. Broadcasting tonight, though, from Los Angeles, my first trip to this extraordinary city where I'm involved in dialogues about whether Shakespeare can somehow link up to Los Angeles as well as to Washington. Uh, watch this space for more news on that. But to the matter at hand. Uh, tonight, we are talking about Falstaff, this extraordinary character, this archetype, this force of nature. And uh, before we get started on our discussion, let me share a few thank yous. The Shakespeare Hour Live is supported as part of our larger initiative, Shakespeare Everywhere, by the amazing Beach Street Foundation. Uh, additional support is supplied by Nan Beckley, and tonight's episode is sponsored by Donna Shelton and Frank Doe. My sincere thanks to all of those extraordinary people. Well, we have an excellent panel lined up tonight, and uh, none of them are strangers to uh, Sir Jack Falstaff. Uh, and let's get started. It's my great pleasure to introduce STC affiliated artist, Edward Gero. He is a four time Helen Hayes award winner, and his numerous acting credits include The Originalist of Broadway, Henry IV parts one and two in the title role at STC, and Henry IV part one at the Forger Theatre in 2019. He's also a professor of theatre at George Mason University. Edward, good evening and welcome. Hi, Simon. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, lovely to see you, Edward. <laughs> well, Edward, look, I mean, sort of spring, indeed, summer is in the air. The vaccinations are rising. Uh, optimism, I think, is is beginning to uh, fill the country. How are you feeling about the, the the months ahead? Are you looking forward to getting back on stage? Oh, of course. Absolutely. I'm, we're fully vaxxed. Uh, I, I'm... I, as far as I know, I'll be back with you in the spring doing uh, a play. I don't know if you've, I can say that yet, but <laughs> I'm very excited uh, to come back to uh, my artistic home and uh, work with you. So great. I'm so very excited to get back on stage. Excellent. And I think that's actually a really exciting hint uh, that Edward's coming back to do a well known Shakespeare at Shakespeare Theatre Company with me in the spring. Excellent cliffhanger. Um, Rosa Joshi, whose credits include Henry V at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Henry IV Part I at the Forger Theatre, indeed with, I believe, Edward, and the co-founder of the acclaimed Upstart Pro Collective. She is a professor of theatre at Seattle University, where I think you're joining us this evening, Rosa. Hello, good evening. Hello, thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here and be part of this panel. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to welcome you to the show. Um, let me ask you, if I may, how did you first come to Full Staff? Uh, was something that you did through the page or through the stage? I think I, I think I saw the plays before I read them. So I had watched, I'd seen numerous productions and had not, but so my first real encounter with really digging into Full Staff was when I directed um, the play with the fabulous Ed Giro in the in the role of Falstaff at the Folger to really dig into the text mm. um, and all, often also seeing compilations you know not seeing the whole of Henry the Henry four part one seeing um, a part of it as part of a larger compilation so it was really amazing to really get into the text. Yes, and it makes me think, Rosa, that as directors, it's almost the best part of our job is getting to read the plays in this kind yes. of super intense way, which we yes. would never, never do normally. But it's a very privileged, close read, isn't it, directing? A play. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it really reading it in a very different way because you know you have to to make this to realize this and engage an audience and make it make sense to an audence also. Yeah, it's a little bit like, dare I say, a kind of Frankenstein's monster, isn't it? The way we're, we're <laughs> working how to electrocute, as it were, into, in, into, we hope, successful life. Yeah, and also how to make it really live and spark for a contemporary audience and for a contemporary American audience also. Yes, yes. And that, I hope, is something that we'll talk about this evening, actually. Full stuff as he was, as it were, at the beginning, and full stuff as he or she, as it were, might be today. Um, scholar. Dr. Jeffrey R. Wilson, faculty member of the Harvard University Writing Program, is also with us this evening. He's the author of Shakespeare and Trump, which was published in April 2020. So that's another interesting character to also um, perhaps uh, speak of this evening. Uh, how are you, Jeffrey? Just fine. Thanks, Simon, for the introduction. Uh, Rosa, Ed, so great to be here with you. Thanks to the whole community there behind the scenes, kind of getting us all together and online here to, to share this Wednesday evening. 
Oh, that's wonderful, Jeffrey. Thank you. And uh, we're all very excited by your backdrop, which is truly Shakespeare everywhere. <laughs> that's, that's right. Happening now, Shakespeare <laughs> enters... <laughs> Great. Um, well, uh, uh, I mean, it slightly, um, it slightly reminds me, indeed, of the uh, uh, of the rumored um, um, production that uh, that uh, Ed and I are doing next year, which is, uh, in fact, going to be set in a cable newsroom without giving too much away. So this is an excellent preparation for that. Anyway, uh, Jeffrey, let me ask you a little bit about about Falstaff. Is he a character that you've always loved? Uh, <laughs> I suppose I'll just come right out and say it. I'm kind of anti Falstaff. Uh, I'm going to now take cover. I'm going to shield myself from, from the torpedoes that will surely start coming my way. Um, so let me back up on a little bit of qualification and a little bit of context. <laughs> um, so Falstaff, you know, if, if we're looking at him, uh, if we're looking at the English monarchy, it's an absurd institution and it creates an absurd ideology and Falstaff stands against that. And so that makes Falstaff appealing. Um, because he wants to, you know, burn it down. And we, we love that. But then just when I think about Falstaff and, and I, I um, you know, think about would I want to spend 15 minutes at a pub with this guy? Would I want this guy to be my son-in-law? Um, I just don't think I would really like him all that much. Uh, you know, he, he's, his jokes aren't as funny as he thinks they are. They're always at someone else's expense. And, and he, he was born into privilege, but he feels no sense of obligation to the community. And, and he, he, you know, he just doesn't take responsibility for anything. And, and so um, that for me crashes up in really fascinating ways with this um, different perspective, which is the way that we've seen uh, Falstaff's body represented, mistreated both within the plays and then in the history of Shakespearean theater and criticism. Um, the way that he, as a person who has a disability experience, has had to carry the weight of all of these assumptions and all of these attitudes about his body. Um, for me, it's, he's just a, a fascinatingly complex character. And I guess I, I, when I engage on the level of ideology, I might be kind of, you know, really, really excited about him. But when I think about personality, I get a little bit less so. And I suppose that's, that's sort of the, the complexity in all of it. Nice. Well, I mean, thanks for, 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 get, for getting us started or with, with, with such firepower, Jeffrey. I mean, that's that's uh, I'm really looking forward indeed to responding to some of those uh, fascinating uh, dichotomies that you've identified. Before we do so, let me introduce um, members of the team. It's, um, of course, STC Line producer Grace Ann Roberts is with us. Grace Ann, hello. Good evening. How are you? Hi, everyone. Good evening. So happy to be here. Great. And as always, Grace Ann, you'll be the great bridge between us and our dear viewers this evening. Um, how are people already? Some some thoughts and, and, and comments in the, in the chat you'd like to share? Our audience seems great. They all seem happy to be here. Um, we had viewer Rose kick us off with a question, actually, um, if anyone had a favorite actor in the role of Falstaff. So their folks are answering with Orson Welles, uh, Mr. Giroux. Uh, folks oh. are praising your performance at the Folger. Um, so chat already beginning that is great and i think as we talk this evening a lot of those very um iconic performances we're going to be flashing in front of us all i know i'm, I'm already remembering full stuff that i've seen and so i think that's going to be fascinating sort of as we talk about images and memories and uh, and textual steers uh, how they all line up um without further ado uh dr drew lichtenberg is with us our in-house dramaturg and my co-host drew over to you to get us started uh, thank you, Simon. And uh, I love it, Jeff. You, you put somebody in front of a cable news uh, backdrop and you get the hot takes firing off right away about Falstaff. Falstaff, pro or con? Are we canceling Falstaff? Or are we in favor of Falstaff? I love it. Keep them coming. Um, I, I, I will say I, at, at dinner tonight, I asked my two children, a, a seven-year-old uh, girl and a, a nine-year-old boy, I told them the story of the Henry IV plays. And I, I said, so Falstaff hero or villain? and one picked hero and one picked villain. And of course it was my son, who's kind of like the rule follower who picked villain. And it's my daughter, who's the party animal who picked hero. <laughs> mm, interesting, yeah, you have a dichotomy going on in your own household. Uh, well, just a brief crazy on the topic. We last, we last touched on Falstaff, I believe, in week five, which was a month, almost a month after the pandemic began. Roughly a year ago, this time, our guests were uh, Stephen Greenblatt, uh, Sam Waterston, 
and Kelly Curran, uh, who have all had some relationship to Henry IV, uh, part one and two. Uh, the title of that episode was Virtue and Vice, uh, which we were sort of uh, reappropriating something Samuel Johnson, the great Shakespearean critic, wrote about Falstaff, uh, I believe in the late, well, the, the early 18th century. Uh, a compound of sense and vice, of sense which may be admired but not esteemed, of vice which may be despised but hardly detested. So, so Samuel Johnson, hot off the presses with an early take on Falstaff, which I think continues to shape uh, the discourse. Uh, so I wanted to ask each of our panelists, even though we've already, we've already dove in because Falstaff is just such a tasty subject, you can't help uh, yourself. Uh, why Falstaff? Why has this character, of all the characters in Shakespeare, save for a few others, you know, thinking maybe here of, of Hamlet or Rosaline, why has this character inspired such fascination amongst generations, centuries of critics, scholars, directors, actors, uh, and also what compelled each of you? What drew each of you uh, to Falstaff? And finally, what role do you think Falstaff plays in these plays? Why is he there? Uh, so Jeff, you, you sort of already gave us your thoughts on your personal struggles with Falstaff. You take maybe a, a personal affront at the character, but politically you, you, you appreciate what he's there for. I'm wondering if yeah, you wanna expand a little further. Just real quickly, I'll, I'll suppose uh, I'll mention just kind of how I, I came to Falstaff, which is through the lens of Richard III. And I, I think we can read Falstaff and Richard III uh, in really close connection with each other. Um, so both have marked bodies, both are audience favorites, both are hilarious, both are villainous, but that villainy works very differently in these two different cases. Um, both are opposed to the monarchy, both are stigmatized, both have experience with disability. Um, both are then excluded from the society that's established at the end of the story by the king of normalcy who returns to set things right. The big difference for me was that Richard III occurs on a kind of supernaturalized stage with ghosts and, and um, you know, uh, theologically um, present phenomena, whereas Falstaff doesn't. Falstaff occurs on a naturalized stage. And I'd be so fascinated to hear from, from Rosa and Ed about kind of how they created the stage, the, the atmosphere that surrounds Falstaff and how that might um, kind of influence the interpretation of his body and, and his meaning and so forth. Yeah, it just reminds me, Jeff, hearing you, hearing you speak of Richard III, last week we had this amazing uh, conversation about Shakespeare training and the director, Shauna Cooper, who I believe has also directed Ed at Woolly Mammoth, was walking us through Petruchio's speech uh, in Taming of the Shrew and talking about internal divisions, uh, the way in which Shakespeare's language can double back on itself, which of course famously he does in that Richard III monologue. It seems like by the time he's gotten to Falstaff, he's much more, he's writing an internally divided character in a much more sophisticated way. Also it's in, it's in most of Falstaff is in prose, not in verse, which may be one of the reasons for this. Rosa, uh, yeah, Jeff was saying as a director, uh, you're bringing this character to life in three dimensions. Uh, so it's, it's a much different kind of problem than all these theoretical things we're talking about, uh, self-division and the, the complexity of the character. So how do you start framing or, or approaching a figure like Falstaff? Yeah, so, you, you know, you start with the text, you read and read and read and read, but, um, and then I'm, I'm always interested in, um, duality and discovering a character through their contradictions. So this question of whether um, he's a hero or a villain is, is, is well, both, yes, of course, because he's unfailingly human. And so I think that's part of the, the, you know, what draws him, he's so charismatic. He is, right? He's great fun. He's charming, he's magnetic. Um, and as Jeffrey says, you know, you, you may not, do you want to really know him? Well, you would while the party's going on. Like he's the one who'll let, who'll say, "Hey, have another beer, eat some more cake." Like he is really, he's really um, the life of the party. But it always struck me that that was driven by a sense of desperation, this indulgence, this excess. He always, he struck me uh, as someone who came off the page as someone who's, you know, keeping the demons at bay. So the image I had 
I think early on I talked to um, Ed about it's like I just kept seeing in a contempt you know in a contemporary context like Falstaff is on that dance floor it's 4 a.m. the DJ wants to go home but he is dancing been dancing and dancing because if he stops dancing then the and the party is over then the demons the darkness will descend upon him and that's where I feel like the fear and the vulnerability of Falstaff for me um, that's what I connect to that human frailty. There's, you know, he's someone who's who's been to war, who's seen death, and he's someone who's battling his own mortality. Uh, the crowd he hangs with, I'm, I'm struck by that. You know, they're they're younger than him. You know, I was interested in the idea that he he keeps company with this younger crowd to keep feeling his youth and keep his own mortality at bay. And you know, he's always vowing to reform. I'll stop drinking. I'll stop smoking. I'm gonna, you know, and that feels very human. So, so I guess to me, all his failures and his failings and the things that, that um, are the things that for me actually make him more relatable um, as a character. Yeah, fascinating. And yet, as you say, there is this self-destructive uh, capacity in the character that is almost nihilistic or, or terrifying. You, you get a sense that Falstaff really is the agent of his own destruction. Uh, and Ed, you were, you were sharing some fascinating thoughts uh, before we went live or over email uh, on, on the kind of, kind of uh, spiritual struggle. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, along the lines of what Rose and I talked about early on about this, one of the things that uh, I found with him was this, from the very beginning, he's, he's afraid of dying, right? And, and has this conversation with God through the play right from the very beginning. The last thing that, that the prince says to him is fall to your prayers. So there's a moral, I think there's a moral issue. I, I think of, I think of Falstaff as sort of an id. He's the id with great wit, right? And he's like, he's like the, the pure gint. He like, he gets in these, we, we, we love to watch him scramble out of the issue, scramble out of being responsible and also dealing with addiction. I mean, I think Shakespeare, I mean, you look at this issue with alcohol uh, that you know, I want to reform, I have to pull my life together. That's from the very beginning, whether he's acting it, whether it's performative or not. Um, through the course of the play, he has this ongoing issue about, I need to reform before I die. And what, what is my life? What is it worth? And I think that's one of the reasons why I think we, we love him is because he is us. All the things that we, that we find reprehensible in him are the things we find reprehensible in ourselves and are afraid to admit it. But, but it's the given full bore, full fleshed out. And, and I think part of his size is the fact that he is so indulgent and, and it, there's no boundary. Uh, and he's, he's paying for it now. And, and he, he wants to find a way to you know, survive that. And let, let me live another day. You know, even the first scene with uh, with Hal, and he says, "I have to reform." And then said, "Well, you want to go rob?" Oh, okay. I mean, he, he, you know, give me one more day with impunity. And I think that's the issue, the moral issue, is that the reckoning is coming, and it finally does come with the king. But it's really, what is it about in his life that has any meaning? He, I mean, he gives it away. He reject. I think he kills God in part one when he says that my I, that that's the end of my catechism. I've had it with you. I'm going to this honor thing. This narrative about being a, a hero is nonsense. It's all narrative. And in a in a in a post moral world, kind of in a way that we're in now, to have this conversation about morality is really interesting. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to 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 have some kind of compass? Uh, and certainly the how represents that and you know he's totally the uh you know the ego if not the super ego right but but you know the id gets has to have the reckoning and he does i find it fascinating i think we i think we love him for that because he like you say rosa he's absolutely human yeah so if on the one hand as rosa says he's self-destructive on the other hand ed you point out he is the life force in extremis he shows how uh the plenitude of life yeah, indeed. Uh, before Hal goes into self Denial mode. Jeff, you had a you had a thought. I, I was just going to, those were two amazing thoughts from, from Rosa and Ed, I, I suppose I should mention. So one kind of lens that I approached Falstaff through is as I'm a recovering alcoholic, I'm celebrating 22 years sober this summer. 
so I, I that that line that Ed is alluding to is, you know, when Falstaff says, if I had a thousand sons, I would tell them to addict themselves to sack. First of all, it is fascinating to see in the year 1597, someone thinking about alcohol in terms of addiction, that is centuries ahead of its time. Um, second of all, if you're, you know, someone who can happily drink socially, that line's pretty funny. If you're an alcoholic, you know, as Rosa was kind of saying, how much pain there is behind that line and, and how much pain there is in Falstaff's life. And for me, that's something that, that I see the character. And, and we started off on such a, a somber note for talking about Falstaff, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to the jokes and everything. But, but I, I think um, kind of there's this hidden backstory there that I, as I was saying, I can't really kind of get past to, to celebrate the sort of the, the rebellious takedown of aristocracy with Falstaff yet. And also this idea, Jeff, as Ed was saying, that he, he struggles with God, he kills God, and then lives in a post-moral universe. That's Nietzsche. It's Shakespeare uh, three, 300 years ahead of Nietzsche. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ed, you had a thought, and I'll also yeah. sign it. Great. I just wanted to dovetail on what Jeff said. The, the, the speech about Sack, it's in the same place in part two as the honor speeches in part one. And where he kills God in part one, he's now he knows he, there's no there's no uh, uh, forgiveness for him. He's, so drink. That's all he has left. He's going to go full bore now because there's no way he can come back and he knows it. And it's in that same place. I, I think it's fascinating structurally that's in the same place uh, in that other play. I think I just froze. Yeah, Ed um, is frozen, but he will come back to us. Simon. Back. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, yes, I was just, um, I think in a second, it might be really interesting. Um, maybe, Drew, just for you to give us a little synopsis of of, of just to remind us of the of, of the, 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 nar the narrative in its simplest form. Then we might go to Jeff, who I think has some pictures, just so we can kind of track a little bit about the origins of this, this force. I just, before I do that, want to throw in one thought that um, we, we said at the beginning of the show, we'd be remembering great performers of the, of the role of which we have one on the show with us, which is really exciting. Um, but I'm also remembering Robert Stevens, um, who I saw play the role at the Royal Shakespeare Company. I think he was married to Maggie Smith and he was uh, himself a great raconteur, a great drinker. Um, and his size, uh, as, as, as a fairly young person watching it, um, it, now it seems like an odd comparison, but I'm reminded of Big Bird in Sesame Street. There's something that when you see Big Bird, that there's something you kind of can't really resist. There's something you can't, uh, nor process, nor quite um, figure out other than, but it inspires in one a kind of awe at this, at this other otherworldly presence. And Robert Stevens had that. It was like he, he was like a Father Christmas that you worried was probably drinking a little bit too much on Christmas Eve. It, it, it was both deeply charismatic and this, this very distant sense of feeling of the poignancy that, that, that people have spoken about. And it was totally arresting. But um, yes, Jeff, do you want to talk? Oh, true, you were going to talk a little bit about the story. Yeah, well, the, the story, I, I'm sure any of us could give this, this narrative uh, simply, but in its purest form, uh, Falstaff is a friend of the princes, of Prince Hal, who is the heir apparent, who is spending most of his time not doing what an heir apparent should, which is learning uh, good governance from his father, King Henry, uh, a role that, Ed, you also played when we did it at STC, uh, opposite Stacey Keach's Falstaff. Um, but he's hanging out with this knight. He's a sir, Sir Jack Falstaff. Uh, he's a knight in name, but in reality, he is a, a drunkard, he, he resorts with prostitutes and thieves and lowlifes in taverns and inns and brothels. He, he robs people on the way to Canterbury, on the road to Canterbury for fun, uh, and then steals their money, like uses it for, for ill-gotten means and, and ends and drinks and gambles. He's basically just a, a catalog of vices. Uh, and he is ultimately somebody who Prince Hal tosses aside and says, I can't be friends with you anymore in order to be King Henry the, V. And yet uh, he keeps coming back. You know, Henry the Fourth Part One was such a popular play. So many quartos of it were pop published. I believe seven quartos, which is the most of any Shakespeare play that Shakespeare then goes out and writes part two, which is an unplanned sequel. And then he keeps him off stage in Henry V, but he even kind of creeps his way on stage there. He's killed in this extraordinary, his, his death is narrated from off stage, but in this extraordinary scene by Mistress Quickly. And then Shakespeare writes another sequel, Merry Wives of Windsor, which is Falstaff in a, in a comedy, uh, which the legend has it, uh, Elizabeth I loved Falstaff so much, the queen, that she demanded Shakespeare write a, a play where Falstaff is among us in contemporary 
Windsor, which is a suburb of London. So Falstaff is this kind of this kind of creation of Shakespeare, a little bit like Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, who he has to kill halfway through that play, or else he would run away with the play. Uh, and yet Falstaff is an even greater creation, arguably, than Mercutio, because Shakespeare keeps on giving him uh, new life. Uh, you could say he sort of overtakes the narrative. He, he takes control of the narrative away from Shakespeare. Um, so that's the story. Yeah, Jeff. I wonder if you could maybe orient us a little bit more in some of the history and the sources, uh, dr dramaturgically, but also historically, of where Falstaff comes from. Yeah, sure. So one, one of the fascinating editorial things about uh, Falstaff is that originally we know his name was Sir John Oldcastle. Um, there's a couple of places in the text where Shakespeare had changed the name, we think, to appease um, a, a noble person at the time um, so that the, the, the descendant of the Sir John Oldcastle wouldn't be offended, but he left in a couple puns in a couple places. And so um, we, we've got an image of Sir John Oldcastle. So Sir John Oldcastle was this 15th century Lollard, which means he's a, a kind of proto-Protestant, um, someone who kind of stood against Catholic orthodoxy. He's a friend of Henry V. Um, he gets burned at the stake for heresy for his uh, religious uh, unorthodoxy. Um, so this is one of the... the uh, origins of, of Falstaff, but the fascinating thing is that there's three or four different uh, woodcuts images of, of Sir John Oldcastle from the 15th uh, century, um, 16th century rather. And, and you know, he's, he's a pretty muscular guy. He looks like a heroic guy out on the battlefield. And so one of the, the fascinating questions I have is, is why is Falstaff fat? Why, why does he have to be fat? Um, and we've talked about kind of the, the, the size of the role, the size of everything that, that Falstaff signifies and how much Falstaff has been um, made to, to, to carry that weight. Um, but the reason kind of nuts and bolts that Falstaff has to be fat is if we look at the end of Richard II, which is the play that comes before the first part of Henry IV in, in the sequence, we hear about this son of the king Prince Hal, who is irresponsible, irresolute, spends all of his time at bars. That's kind of the origin of, of Falstaff. Shakespeare sort of needed a gang of friends to represent Henry being irresponsible, not upholding the uh, duty of, of the, the position, the noble position that he was born into. And so that's where you get Falstaff and all of Falstaff's friends um, who are at the, the, the bars. And then one way that Shakespeare kind of symbolizes or represents uh, irresponsibility is through excessive eating, excessive drinking. And so that's kind of how, how Falstaff, you know, shifts from one body form into another body form that then inside the play, not only in our critical history has been interpreted so often, but inside the play, everyone's trying to interpret Falstaff's body, both Falstaff himself and Prince Hal are trying to create these competing interpretations of what it means. And you know what's what's one of the things that's interesting about this play is that if you think about Falstaff's relationship to the plot, and I'm sure Rosa, you can you can back me up on this. Falstaff is completely irrelevant to the plot of Henry the Fourth, Part One, in many ways. Uh, the plot is about you know this rebellion being led by Hotspur and whether Prince Hal is going to help his father put it down. And Falstaff is is kind of a B plot or a side plot or a subplot. Uh, all all of these fun and games with Falstaff almost are happening in a separate universe that's not integrated uh, with the main plot of the play, which is all about these problems that King Henry IV is having putting down Hotspur's rebellion. Uh, so it's a very unusual thing that Shakespeare does in this play, inventing essentially this kind of fictional uh, morality play in the shadows of this history play. And, and that kind of overwhelms uh, the dramaturgy in performance. Usually it's always the Falstaff scenes that people remember. I, I think that's, that's really a student. Um, and, and I think that while in the terms of the plot, you, that's true. I think in terms of the psychology of Hal and the journey of Hal, which for me, because I had actually done Henry V before I did Henry the Fourth, so it was really fascinating to you know. By the time Hal becomes Henry the Fifth, everyone talks about him, talks about those days, and and how he's reformed, right? He does reform. So to go back and sort of do the prequel to Henry the Fifth was really fascinating for me, and that that 
Falstaff is an essential part of Hal's journey towards kingship. And so it's really to see that con to see the contrast between Hotspur and Hal um, in Henry the First, uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One. Uh, Falstaff is essential to that, and also I was really interested in how um, Falstaff is a father figure for Hal, the father that Hal wishes that you know he's really estranged from his biological father, so he finds this friend-like father, you know, the father who will play with him. You know, you can't imagine Henry the Fourth ever playing, you know, or hanging out or being his buddy. And so someone who plays instead of lectures him and there's this real love and connection between them, right? Because while Falstaff's trying to hold his, you know, the darkness at bay, Hal is similarly trying to hold off his duties. And so they, they're this perfect, um, these perfect buddies, like I, I feel like it was like the original bromance, <laughs> um, this relationship between them, um, which makes the heartbreak of the betrayal so much deeper when it happens um, because that love is so, I, I, and that to me is also the thing that is, I mean, if we're looking for redeeming qualities of dear Falstaff, that his real love and care for Hal, and yes, you know, he be, he betrays him and he's corrupt in, in all of these ways, but that's because he's human also. It also makes that the line that Ed pointed out in part two about addicting his thousand sons to sack uh, kind of tragic. If he's this father figure who ultimately is going to addict his son to a crippling addiction and a vice, uh, isn't that the ultimate form of betrayal? Uh, uh, we asked each of our guests to choose some passages uh, to look at in a more forensic way. So I wonder, Ed, maybe if we could start with you. Uh, and I think you, you mentioned it a little bit, but it's from Henry IV, part one, if I'm, if I'm correct. Mm. Yeah. That is uh, yeah, which one are you referring to? There's a couple of them here. I, I, I just want to say one. Uh, just dovetailing on what we were just talking about a little bit before we get into this, the that the legacy of that humanity that you know, I, 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 I've done this play four times, starting with Hotspur, played the king, played the chief justice, played Worcester. I was always in the rebel camp or the royal camp. So to go into the the real world of the play, the you know, the here are the elites and here are the people, right? And it was a, a, a really fantastic experience to be able to do that. And then saw great Falstaffs along the way and learned from them. But the thing, and I also played Henry V as a, as a young man, the humanity piece survives in the little touch of Harry in the night. So the Falstaff's legacy actually still survives in Henry V with the, the person that we see how we see the old how of you are. I just wanted to share that because I thought it was uh, significant in that regard. I, I love the way you put that, that uh, there's history, there's, and then there's reality. And that, <laughs> that's the there's world. the world of the politics, right? These, the, here, these are the, that's the mafia over there. And then the real people are over here. Um, no, I, I was looking at the, the, the honor speech uh, uh, particularly because it's, you know, it's, it's that the very famous question, this notion of catechism, um, which is, you know, Shakespeare uses that as a uh, question and answer, like, right. And he talks about, they're about to go into battle and, and, and Hal says, uh, you know, fall to your knees or, you know, I, I, I wish it were, what does he say? Um, uh, I would have were bedtime, Hal, and all well. And, and Henry says, uh, thou owest God a death. And we're at the crux of the, the, the problem here. And he, he tosses it off with a joke. Tis not due yet, he says. I would be loath to pay him before his day. Uh, what need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Why should I go ahead? Well, tis no matter, he says. Honor pricks me on. And here, I think we see him completely deconstruct the narrative of, of honor. And he says, yea, but how if honor prick me off when I come on? How then? Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then? No. But what is honor? A word. What is in that honor? 
What is that honor? Air. It's a trim reckoning. Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday. Doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis sensible then, yea, to the dead, but will it not live with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Therefore, I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon, and so ends my catechism. And I think there he's, he's not saying that I'm not just ending my question and answer, but I've had it with you, God. All this business about honor is, is, is emptiness. It's empty. Being a lie. And the other piece, the other, the other part of it that really is the core of it is in the next speech, he just says, give me life. Give me life. He, he really is the life force. And I think Bloom t uh, touched upon this, uh, what Shakespeare invented with, with Falstaff. He actually did with King John by putting a fictive character of the bastard in a history play. And now we see another fictive, semi-fictive character, but I think he is, because there is some historical uh, antecedent for the bastard as well. But we see that come to fruition and we, we see the morality part of it there because he's not part of the world. He's one foot in, one foot out. Yeah, well, first of all, Ed, uh, what an extraordinary reading that was. Uh, bravo, it's such, a, it's such a privilege to be able to, to be in the room as it were with, with Shakespeare even though we can't, we're not yet, we're getting closer, but we can't yet physically congregate uh, and hear such brilliant readings. Uh, it struck me as you were reading that speech, it's very Hamlet-like, isn't it? This idea of a character sort of standing as askance and looking at the world of the play and commenting upon it, almost like a, a, a critic. Well, he is a critic, absolutely, he's a critic there, right? I mean, lots of times I've seen Falstaff use the speech and get great laughs out of it. And, you know, I'm sure Will Kemp, brought the house down in 1609 with this piece. But there's something much darker in it, right? Uh, and then I think that's what you're touching upon it is. It's, it's, he's criticizing the whole world that he's in. Yeah, Grace Ann, you have a comment or a question from our audience? Yeah, well, just your mentioning of that, Drew, and, and maybe this, you're making a similar connection, but viewer Russell asked uh, a few moments ago, um, Russell says, Harold Bloom ranked Falstaff as one of Shakespeare's um, greatest characters or, or biggest characters, second only to Hamlet, and he wondered if you all agreed, and then he cites Bloom and says, Falstaff is as bewildering as Hamlet, as infinitely varied as Cleopatra. He can be apprehended, but never, never fully comprehended. There is no end to Falstaff. So I just wanted to honor Russell's comment there, too. Yeah, uh, Har Harold Bloom paraphrasing uh, Bottom, describing his dream, right? It is a bottomless dream. Bottom stream for it hath no bottom. Uh, I wonder, Rosa, you, you chose a, a, a passage from earlier in the play uh, where Falstaff characterizes himself as a coward on instinct. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us why you chose that scene and maybe set, set the scene for us a little bit. What is, what is going on uh, when Falstaff says this? Um, well, I think I chose a speech that is just like, it's definitely an actor's and a director's moment to me because you know you can read it but like when you actually live the circumstance of it or do this you know it's it's after the the robbery right that the uh, that's failed and um, they've been robbed themselves the robbers have been robbed and they come back with this grand story of how they've been robbed which Hal and points know is completely false but they let Falstaff dig this the dig keep digging and digging and digging and 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 Falstaff and telling the story gets grander and grander it's like four no there's uh, you end up with like nine um uh thieves in buckram who have who have attacked them right and it just and then Hal right when it at the height of it Hal says we were there we saw you you are so full of it we were there and it was just the two of us and you ran away screaming, what have you got to say for yourself? And right at that moment, you're like, what is Falstaff going to say? Like he has been completely caught with his, you know, with his trousers down. And he says, by the Lord, I knew ye as well as he that made ye. He's like, I knew it was you. 
Like it's so blatantly false. And, and yet everyone, it's, it's so brilliant, right? And he says, why hear you masters? Was it for me to kill the heir apparent? What was I going to kill the kid? Like, I knew exactly what I was doing. And like, I feel like I wish Ed would read this, but I'm just going to read it instead. I'm just going to go for it here. Um, should I turn upon the true prince? Why thou knowest I am as valiant as Hercules, but beware instinct. Right? It's so interesting. He says, I, the lion will not touch the true prince. Instinct is a great matter. I was now a coward on instinct. Like, what a brilliant argument to get out of this. My greater instinct told me that I should be a coward to save the king. I actually did you a favor. I didn't want to embarrass you, right? Um, I shall think the better of myself and thee during my life. I for a valiant lion and thou for a true prince. And then, of course, but by the Lord's lad, I am glad you have the money. Like, because in the end, we still got the money. So I chose a thing that is from the world of East Cheap because that I think is one of the, the, the richness as, as Ed was saying that Hal goes through in that world is what I think makes him a, a leader of the people in when, when he becomes king, right? Which allows that touch of Harry in the night. Um, and Falstaff helps him learn that and be that and and in but also in this moment you know Falstaff is a clown character right like I, I just also feel just like he's this great combination of commedia of pantalone and capitano and arlecchino all wrapped up in one you know um, really complex character and that everybody in the room knows that that is such a blatant lie Everybody in the room celebrates it because it is brilliant. <laughs> and so uh, that to me is, I think also just how we're, we are charmed by him as, as an audience. Yeah, uh, I think what, what you're describing, Rosa, it seems to me like uh, it, Shakespeare is capturing the Lazzi, the Commedia dell'arte comic bit of business on the page. Uh, and it's this complete comic incorrigibility of the character that really comes through in such a charming, charming, beautiful way in that scene. Uh, Simon. Well, um, yes, thank you. But I mean, before, before, before we hear, before we hear Jeff on, on this, I, 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 I'm feeling to myself this um, question of acknowledgement and uh, this term alleviation. I'm thinking about how as we're witnessing and going back to hearing Falstaff's language, that one's reminded we've spoken today about the Falstaff being yet another mirror of ourselves. We, we, we hear the braggart, we hear the liar, we hear the coward, we hear the rhetorician, and we think, oh, that's a bit like me in certain moments. And what happens, I think, is in the moment of, of acknowledgement, there also is a release. There also is an alleviation from shame. Uh, Jeff was speaking from his own experience about drinking and addiction. T just this was, I, and more and more as I as we as we talk uh, on the show and tonight, I'm thinking of the theatre being the Elizabethan form of therapy. You would go to see yourself, and you would go to forgive yourself, and that's still, I think, an active force. And so the more these characters are transgressive or problematic, well, that is all to the good in a way, if it helps our therapy. But um, I'm sure, Jeff, you want to come in on that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a kind of catharsis, isn't it, Simon? This, this release that we get only, arguably, from the theatre, this most ancient of storytelling uh, forms. Yeah, Jeff, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts and also your passage. Yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts are I love theater people. You all are so smart that, that just the, the, the readings that you come up with here, this is, this is amazing. Um, so the, the, the passage I picked out comes just before what might be the most famous description of Falstaff. Um, and so if, to set the stage a little bit, um, for centuries, uh, fatness had been a symbol for gluttony. Um, in, in the 15th, 16th century, Gluttony was identified back in the Garden of Eden as the sin that brought this all crashing down. Um, and so gluttony was one of the sources that the, of the seven deadly sins who were personified. Gluttony was one of the sources of Falstaff, but it gets completely naturalized. And so 
What's fascinating to me about the debate to determine the meaning of Falstaff's body is that it, it happens in the play. And so at the Boar's Head Tavern in 1 Henry IV, Hal takes a few shots at, at Falstaff's girth, and, and then Falstaff creates this counter-reading of his body as signifying virtue. And, and so this is just before this famous description of, of Falstaff as an old fat man. Falstaff, and he's impersonating King Henry uh, in this moment. He says that he is... He, he, he envisions Falstaff as a goodly, portly man. So goodly, a moral word, portly, a physical word. Falstaff's trying to create this connection here. He says, in faith and a corpulent of a cheerful look, a pleasing eye, and a most noble carriage. So, so carriage as in the way that you carry yourself has an ethical valence, but carriage as in, as in your, your, your body, right? A carriage on, on wheels, right? And as I think his age, some 50 or by our lady inclining to three score, and now I remember me, his name is Falstaff. And that man should be lewdly given. He deceiveth me for Harry, I see virtue in his looks. If then the tree may be known by the fruit and the fruit by the tree, then preemptorily I speak, there is virtue in that Falstaff. So what's fascinating to me is that, that rather than making a metaphor out of Falstaff's body himself, Shakespeare staged characters making those meanings. And Hal is the voice of this tradition uh, that he rejects Falstaff. He, he says, again, now Hal impersonates his father. And it's in the context of Falstaff making this counter simile that we get Hal come along and start to symbolize Falstaff's size. And then uh, Prince Hal says, and, and of course we should have Ed read this, right? But he says, there is a devil that haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. A ton of man is thy companion. What dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, that bolting hunch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that rusted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly, that reverend vice, that gray iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years. Wherein is he good but to taste sack and drink it? Wherein neat and cleanly, but to carve a cape on and eat it. Wherein cunning, but in craft. Wherein crafty, but in villainy. Wherein villainous, but in all things. Wherein worthy, but in nothing. And you see these theological meanings that are attached to, to large bodies coming through here. And, and it's fascinating that, that Shakespeare doesn't uh, employ that as part of his dramatic device, but instead he shows different people making meanings out of marked bodies in different ways. So Shakespeare's showing, and, and this is something that we still do all of the time, is, is that the, 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 the different bodies that are marked off by society don't have natural meaning in them, but are ascribed to meaning by different people who are involved in social dynamics, are involved in psychological um, exchanges that they go through. And then so Shakespeare's not sort of metaphorizing these marked bodies, but instead he's showing how people do that. And that to me is a real kind of, that, that's a change. That's something that wasn't happening earlier in the 16th century. It's, it's fascinating to hear uh, the play reinterpreted through a new kind of ableist perspective, uh, Jeff, this discourse about body size and shape and how Shakespeare is pressing it in this way, as well as you know, the discourses on addiction on, on God. But you know, I couldn't help noticing as you were reading, and it was a brilliant reading, I should say, by the way, of that passage, uh, the, the huge broad smiles on Ed and Rosa and Simon's face because theatrically speaking, this is a really fun scene. And it almost has the texture of, um, it, it sort of hows education by Falstaff in a different way, right? I'm gonna train you on how to insult and how to come up with a great litany. It's almost like a freestyle rap battle between uh, Falstaff and Hal. Ed. I, I just wanted to say that the, the rejoinder to all that is when Falstaff rejoins that, who means your grace? He just completely tosses it away. Says, I don't know who, who, who could you possibly be talking about? Which is a, a huge laugh after that fabulous setup. Yeah, I mean, they're talking about really heavy ideas, but they're also kind of like throwing them up in the air at each other and then dropping them and moving on to something Else. And of course, this is the this is the famous play extempore scene in which you have all these meta theatrical frames of, you know, Hal playing his father, playing Hal, F Falstaff playing King Henry, uh, Simon. 
Well, and also I suppose Falstaff is the artist, isn't he? I mean, he's also the writer, he's also the, the, the storyteller, and he is, uh, in a way, it's also a satire on on, on writing. Um, let me just um, go, go over to Grace Anne because um, time is uh, marching on. Grace Anne, how are our audience feeling tonight? Are, are there some reactions or thoughts from, from, from anyone on the Yes, show? actually lots of questions. We're unfortunately not going to be able to get to them all live, but I, I do want to end with um, this question from Bill. Uh, I wondered if this might be a nice way to end, but Bill asks, what can we learn about Falstaff from his friend's reaction to his death? Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that aspect of his arc over the plays, but um, just as we come to a close, what folks might think about that. So this is the scene in, in Henry V, and uh, Russ, I'd be interested to hear from you because you directed that at OSF, but uh, Simon also. Well, just quickly, because I think that's a lovely way to end. What do what do what do we learn about Falstaff from the, the reaction of his friends when he dies? This is something I'd love to hand over to the panel uh, as a kind of parting comments. Before we do that, I just want to flag up some things, if I may, about next week. <laughs> Always an eye on the future um, to say that next week we are going to be talking about. Well, look, next week is the last episode of the Shakespeare Our Live for the time being. Appropriately, we're going to be talking about Shakespeare's last plays. With us um, is going to be Professor Daniel Pollock Pelsner, um, actor Myra Lucretia Taylor, and the Tony Award winning director Mary Zimmerman, who has directed uh, uh, very successfully at Shakespeare Theatre Company as uh, many other places around the world so it's a great panel and the other thing to say about next week is that if you tune in immediately after the show we're going to be sharing news of our forthcoming season so the play that ed and i were referring mysteriously to will all be revealed amongst many others so it's really quite a bumper night next wednesday evening of shakespeare and shakespeare at stc and beyond 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 okay very good. That's the trailer for the future. Let's indeed visit our panelists for, uh, Drew, do you want to just recap Henry V, full start dies, a little bit of synopsizing from Drew, and then let's go to Rosa, to Jeff, and then to Ed. Yeah, so Falstaff's death, it's, it's a very uh, undramatic or anti-dramatic death in, in some ways. Uh, you're in Henry V, which is a play mostly about uh, uh, this war that's happening over in France. And all of a sudden Shakespeare whisks us back to East Cheap, uh, to Mistress Quickly, who is, you know, she's many things. Uh, she's sort of the, the tavern keeper, maybe a romantic love interest of Falstaff, or maybe a spurned, uh, having a spurned relationship with him, uh, complicated relationship. And she sort of has this extremely long kind of Baroque monologue about Falstaff's death. And Rosa, as someone who directed the scene, I'm really curious for, yeah, how you approached it and, and what you, how you interpreted the reactions of characters to Falstaff's death. You know, it was a very particular circumstance that I directed that in at Oregon Shakespeare Festival because I came in um, to direct Henry V and they'd done Henry IV's parts one and two with many of the same cast in the season before. And the actor who um, played Falstaff had actually passed away. So when we got to that scene, it was, the, you know, there were the people who had played those characters in, you know, played Bardolph and um, I don't think Nim, but definitely Mistress Quickly. So when you have that, in a lot of ways, I felt like I, um, my job as a director was to do as little as possible in some ways. Does that make sense? Because the real, um, it was, the grief was genuine. The connection was so genuine, but it really does, the, um, but, the, but the line that always stayed with me also is, the, and I'm paraphrasing, but the king has killed his heart. Like the loss of Hal. And I think that's when I went back to, to um, do Henry IV part one. It was like, yeah, he's died of a broken heart. And so this connection with Falstaff must be really deep and genuine in order to earn that by the time you get there. So I think um, that's the part that, I, and that he was loved, deeply, deeply loved. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's they, thanks for sharing that. It is a, a, a wonderful reminder that uh, people who make theater are real people and that these are not abstractions, these productions, they are 
They are performances that happen at a specific time in people's lives, and and they are markers of of, of time and of and of change, you know, of mortality. Uh, and of course, that was true for Shakespeare and his company as well. Um, uh, it's also interesting because the the scene in Henry V is very long and very emotional, and you you almost when you're producing, I would imagine when you're producing Henry V, which I haven't worked on, but it seems like the full effect of it is only felt if, as as you say, you're a member of a repertory company, and the same actors have been in these scenes, and you can kind of add these scenes together over multiple plays. I'm thinking of the scene at the end of Henry IV, Part Two, where Falstaff kind of he rides to London in pomp, and he thinks. Prince Hal's gonna receive him and all of his friends and they're gonna be made in the shade. They're gonna be like, you know, those, those insider, those, those members of the cabinet. And Hal just completely devastatingly says, I know you not, old man, essentially get out of my sight. I don't want you near me. So you add these scenes together and it has a cumulative effect over the plays. I'm curious, Ed and Jeff, if you have thoughts on the death of Falstaff, whether Falstaff can ever be killed. Yeah, um, I suppose my my gloss on that that uh, really amazing story from from Rosa, tricky story, um, is that Shakespeare's second tetralogy is a, a kind of secularized morality play. So there's Falstaff as the vice, and there's King Henry as the virtue, and then there's Hal as the everyman in the balance. And then the question is whether Hal is going to choose the world of the pub or the world of the court, and as this kind of coming of age tale. Hal eventually chooses the court, and then, as we were saying, he, he banishes Falstaff at the end of two Henry IV. Um, so it has this sort of theological origin and structure to it, but what happens with the vice character at the end of the morality plays is that he kind of jumps aboard the devil's back, and it's this kind of goofy comic ending, and ho, 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 he gets carried off stage, and, and virtue has conquered vice. As, as Rose is kind of saying here, the death of Falstaff is so different from that, is so kind of human and, and just um, realistic and naturalistic that the, the specificity of diseases that Falstaff has by the time we get to his death and Henry V is all, it's almost medical. Um, and, and so uh, especially in this uh, moment that Rosa is describing sort of seeing the naturalization that happens over the course of Falstaff's story, starting with this kind of theological origin, but then becoming more and more realistic, more and more naturalized over the course of those four plays. And then over the course of 400 years of performing those four plays, that, that's kind of that, that performance that Rosa described as sort of like the natural culmination of all of that, just becoming more and more human. Yeah, uh, interesting. Ed, as someone who has acted in Henry V as a kind of expert uh, of the theater. Uh, obviously, Falstaff's not on stage in that scene where they're describing his death, but I'm wondering, yeah, for your thoughts. Well, you know, ever the contrarian, I would think that Falstaff is actually the everyman uh, and, and Hal is the hero because, and he, even though he is the vice, the last thing we hear from him, the last utterance on his deathbed is God, God, God. He's made it. Somehow he's made it. He's he's made it. The journey's done. And, you know, we, we started this discussion talking about duality, and I'm wondering if uh, this is part of the brilliance of Shakespeare. Uh, he can be both the vice and the everyman in one. You know that he he combines these seemingly opposite categories in one character who is not reducible to anything other than Falstaff, which is what <laughs> I think Noah Bloom said he is. We never come to the end. Uh, we keep on turning over the character in our in our minds and on stages. Yeah, Jeff. Just just real quickly, as the scholar here, I don't want to go forth with Harold Bloom being the only name cited here. So if you want to read more about Falstaff, go check out Elena Levy Navarro. Go check out Rebecca Lemon. Go check out Tobin Siebers. Go check out Royce Best. Some of the the, the best most recent scholarship. I'm citing my sources. This is what scholars do. <laughs> Well, we also mentioned Samuel Johnson uh, at the top of the show, uh, but you're right. Absolutely. Go check out all those names. And, and Jeff, maybe we'll hit you up for like some, some Amazon book links to put in our newsletter. Uh, uh, over to you, Simon. Well, terrific. I mean, it's, it says it all that we have a newsletter, that we have a devoted audience, that we have a devoted community, that our 
so excited about wrestling with these questions and every week my own passion is renewed by the by the intensity and the quality of the debate so it falls to me to say a huge thank you to rosa to uh, edward to jeff for bringing full staff very much to life tonight and um and as my appetite is hugely whetted to see the great jack knight the knight of the realm that is jack full staff on the stages again very soon one way or another so Thank you very, very much for joining us. See you all next week for more. And in the meantime, it's good night from me and good night from a wonderful panel. Good night.